Good afternoon or morning, I'm wherever you're joining from. Yeah, thanks for uh, for taking the time for this uh, this wonderful gathering this morning or this afternoon. I'm I'll start off. I'm Charles Buchanan. I'm the I'm a I'm a I'm a board member with the BBPA. Uh, very proud and excited to be part of this organization and uh, bring in uh, great programming and information to the community. Uh, when I'm not doing BBPA work, I am run an organization called Technology Helps, which focuses on the eradication of technology poverty. So we work with community members and social purpose organizations to keep them supported and safe. And by safety, one of the things, important things we do is cybersecurity. And uh, so cybersecurity as uh, by, the, by the looks of this gathering today and from what people are seeing is, is one of the single biggest threats to, to businesses today. And uh, it affects all businesses. It's uh, last last we looked at it was like a ten trillion dollar a year global industry cybercrime, and it's not it's not simple. And the methods are getting worse, and it's becoming significant for 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 our businesses. And it particularly affects at risk businesses that have, have fairly low defenses that cannot protect themselves. So. So today we're we're going to be talking about cybersecurity, and we we've assembled an incredible panel of uh, of people from our community. Like I mean, so one of the things I'm, I'm it, that's great to see is that we do have we do have strength in our community. We have our people are strong in in the areas that could be helpful to us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with uh, I'll introduce each panelist, but instead of just doing the standard bio and uh, whatever, what I'm going to do is have each person introduce themselves, just say who they are little bit about their background, but also as part of that introduction, tell us how they got into cybersecurity and why did they choose this career path? How, so who are you? What do you do? How did you get here? And, uh, and what, and, uh, and what happened along the way that made you acknowledge security as the single most important thing to focus on right now? So I'm going to start off with, uh, with uh, my, our, my sister, Pamela Johnson. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I'm Pamela Johnson. I'm a senior cybersecurity risk specialist with a Love Lower team. And um, I, I would say uh, in terms of how I started my career, I, I pretty much got thrown in. Like it wasn't a choice at first <laughs> because uh, I had just graduated from school uh, back in the day and I was just, you know, applying for jobs and I got this company. I think they were just looking for, you know, young graduates that were, you know, enthusiastic, ready to get on the job that were, you know, comp computer science graduates, which I was at the time. So um, I, I got into the job and we had, it was a consulting firm pretty much. So we had clients uh, that were to be serviced and pro it was a projectized environment. So I was plugged into one of the projects, servicing some clients and it was pretty much cybersecurity. We were helping these clients to get certified to and comply with ISO standards for cybersecurity. So that pretty much kicked off uh, my journey for me. Uh, over the years, I kind of tilted a little bit towards the technology angle, but a few years ago, I was like, no, I want to come back to cybersecurity. So I was able to, you know, pivot back into cybersecurity, which I'm happy and still excited to be in. So yeah, I'm looking forward to an exciting uh, interaction today. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pamela. Yeah, my brother, uh, Ola Babal Babalola. Yeah, excited to be here as well. Uh, my name is Ola Babalala, and I also work for Lob Law as part of the Assurance and Risk team. Um, and as part of my role today, um, I'm responsible for um, developing and managing the enterprise security standards and policies. Um, obviously, that ensures that you know our most critical assets are protected um, from both internal and external threats. Uh, and we definitely take a proactive approach in that sense. In terms of my journey to cybersecurity, it's really, for me, it's like, you know, several turns and twists. Um, my background is um, in mathematics and computer science. And somehow that led me to like a career in stock booking and investment. So that was what I did for a couple of years, you know, watching the financial markets, you know, managing, um, um, investment portfolios um, and you know after years of doing that you know I got this opportunity to become a subject matter expert you know for 
a significant project that that was running at the time and that sort of you know rekindled my passion for technology once again and and ever since it's been an evolving one so from that project i transitioned into um, becoming a senior business analyst you know with project deeply involved in cyber security and so with each project you know my passion just grew and grew for cyber security. So today uh, I, I work in security governance and assurance and um, I really chose this career because you know, I wanna make a difference within you know, the community of people protecting and defending you know, our digital world. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Ola. Now let's go with my brother, DeRace. Thanks, Charles. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. I'm Darius Rose, uh, founder of Opal Cybersecurity and Compliance, a service-based uh, IT service uh, cybersecurity company that actually has products now that allow people to comply with some of the most popular um, cybersecurity frameworks, as Pamela mentioned, ISO, SOC 2, and um, And when how I got into the cyberspace, like growing up, which I, I kind of grew up on in Little Jamaica, which is an area that the BPPA focuses on. So I really appreciate that. Um, but growing up, I was always fascinated by technology, even though I didn't see many people that looked like me or us in that world. Cybersecurity, for me in particular, looked like an elite club. So my journey became more out of curiosity and the need to protect my own family business, Raps on Eglinton, and then my job and essentially starting up my small uh, web development organization where people wanted to be secure but didn't know much about it. So it came out of curiosity. Uh, over the years, I realized that lack of diversity in the field wasn't just a representation issue. It's actually a security issue. I, we bet on that four years ago and have continued to reap the benefits of that even today. Different perspectives are critical to anticipate threats. I know a lot of us here are computer science graduates and so, you know a lot of university grads, but I don't want people to think that you have to have that as a background to get into the business. In fact, some of my best penetration testers barely graduate high school, to be honest with you, and they're employed by some of the biggest banks in this country, as well as banks in the United States, to help protect their systems. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I love talking to people that want to get into the space. Don't be um, afraid to get in if you're not necessarily trained in it. It's an area where we need people that don't see it from our lens so that we can actually understand the unknown unknowns that are about to happen, especially with the advent of AI and machine learning technologies. Okay, thanks so much, Ray. So, so yeah, so what, before we, as we're going to delve into, so this is going to be a conversation. We're going to be just talking. It's going to be like, so, you know, just talking about cybersecurity as people who are very deep in that space. So before we get into a deep conversation around it, so why don't we just set the stage? So I'm I'm going to, I'm going to ask Pamela, uh, just what is cybersecurity? And, you know, share some real life examples of incidents that might have a significant impact on business or and lessons you've learned from some of those uh, those situations. I'll let you start with that, and then, then we might pick up on it with uh, Ola and Therese. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, pretty much a lot of people now, even grandmas and grandpas, are starting to you know learn and know what cybersecurity is. So I'll just put it in very very simple terms. Like it, it just refers to a combination of you know technology, processes, practices, all focused on protecting systems, protecting data from attack, from damage, just protecting them from you know the threat actors or hackers as some people call them as well. So that's pretty much doing whatever you need to do to protect your data. I would just put that in simple terms. And so in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of like cybersecurity incidents, examples, a uh, real life example that uh, I would say I, I was part of in a, a previous experience. Uh, maybe I would say it was an almost incident, but you know it, it was something uh, I would say it's called a business email compromise. So this is where you have an email conversation going and then, uh, it gets intercepted and, you know, so I'll just start it like this. So we had uh, uh, an, an organization and then we had a vendor uh, that we had partnered with and there was a payment that was to be made to this vendor uh, for their services. And email conversations had been ongoing, you know, about this matter and, you know, the wire transfer that was being planned. And somehow the threat actors, you know, they got into the email, they were able to, you know, uh, gain access on the vendor's side, on the vendor's email platform, and they got into their email, got into the thread, and were listening in, and took the next step to actually 
hijack that converse, conversation from the vendor side. So now they started to respond on the email, like they were the vendor saying, oh yeah, uh, by the way, our bank details have changed. Um, we have updated our bank details and here's the new bank details for the wire transfer, you know, and stuff like that. So in this case, uh, the person and the accounts payable team uh, luckily, and good thing, like there was a policy in place, which was good, that ensured that you have to do an additional verification check through a, a different means. Uh, so what she did at the point of wire transfer was that she called the vendor contact just to say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm just about to do the transfer, just the final verification. And then the vendor was like, nope, like <laughs> all of that, like I didn't. No, no bank details were changed. Like, I don't know about this latest conversation you think we both had, you know, so that's where it was discovered that, you know, something fishy was actually going on, right? So uh, in, in that case, they were able to prevent it actually. But I know of another incident that happened, you know, somewhere else where it went past this, uh, it went past this point and the transfer was actually done because there was no verification check and, you know, the transfer was made. And then the receiving end, like when they were checking with them, like they were like, no, we didn't get any transfer. And now they were trying to scramble to get the banks to sort of stop the transaction or freeze the account or whatnot. But it was too late actually. So they kind of lost the money and it was a lot of money. So that was one, you know, incident that, you know, we believe could have been prevented if, you know, we, there were some additional security controls uh, put in place, such as that additional verification checks before you make any wire transfer. And especially where you, you know, you hear that, you know, bank details are being updated. You know, that was one, you know, lessons learned from that, you know, put a policy on that. If there is any section of people, maybe, for example, the finance team requires some targeted trainings for, you know, cybersecurity, just to be aware, more aware of, you know, the tricks and, you know, of this, you know, bad <laughs> trade actors. So uh, uh, that's something that also, you know, was good to put in place, those targeted trainings and then, you know, ramping up on, phishing campaigns, again, not clicking on any links, because sometimes this is how they get into our systems, get into our emails and things like that. So all of these kind of um, controls, you know, were, you know, put in place just to ensure that this sort of thing doesn't um, happen again. <laughs> yeah. well, thanks, Pamela. Yeah, we dealt with an organization where they, yeah, the threat, they, they hacked the per yeah the threat actor had gotten in and made himself a sign in authority on the on the bank accounts and uh, and they only found that out because they were still archaic enough to be signed in physical checks they they did they were did not enable electronic tra electronic transfers so that's how they found out that it was a, a this this victor, this Robert who was now assigned an authority on their account so no thanks so much for that so we're just gonna jump in and just so so we've been talking about like I mean a lot of people have been dealing with large organizations and. Uh, Let's, uh, Doris, can you just tell us a little bit about the difference between the security needs for a small organization and a large organization and um, and what small organizations or small businesses should and could be doing about cybersecurity? Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? We can. Awesome. So yeah, uh, great question, Charles and team. Uh, large corporations often have resources and teams dedicated solely to cybersecurity. In addition to that, they have layered defense mechanisms, in-depth training programs, and can recover from incidents rapidly. Small businesses, on the other hand, might not have the same breadth of resources, usually not. They have to prioritize security just as much, though, if not more. For example, if you have a significant breach of the small organization, you, you literally could be out of business if you had the right or you know most crafty ransomware attack, for example, or one of the fraud, like the AP fraud that Pamela just mentioned, you know, Large corporations are usually insured against those type of risks. They usually can get insurance against those risks, which, as we talked about recently, is a very challenging for um, smaller businesses, especially underrepresented small businesses like from our Black community. I think that for small businesses, they have to focus on fundamentals and foundational security measures, like having a policy in place, ensuring all staff are trained and aware of the security threats, and then fostering a security-first culture in their operations. There is, uh, could, yeah, you could just talk a little bit more about the, you, you, you touched on cyber security, cyber insurance, and, uh, and a lot of people just think that, okay, we could just insure against that risk. Just let's let, just talk a little bit about uh, 
the role yeah. of insurance, the misconceptions about insurance. And yeah, we could go, you and I could just talk for days about that. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. yeah. So I would say that cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity insurance is like a safety net, especially for small businesses and, and medium businesses like ourselves. But when considering it, you have to assess the risk profile. How valuable is that data that you're holding for your clients, the, the privacy legislation within your local provincial jurisdiction as well, and what the impacts of a breach both on a privacy side or a cybersecurity side could be, both financially and reputationally. Um, I know when I have these conversations with my dad, it's like, oh, well, don't worry, you have the antivirus or don't worry, you, my son is a good guy and that he can fix it. That's not a solution, right? You have to really embrace what it is that you're operating in. If you have a website, if you're using a payment service like PayPal or Stripe to accept payments, even if you're on a social media platform, there are risks to your business that could affect your reputation and your financial situation. The next piece of it from a coverage perspective is to kind of read the policy because a lot of people come and say, oh, I have coverage. And then I look at it and I'm like, you don't have any coverage, boss. <laughs> you have the coverage yeah. to lose your coverage if any of these issues occur because you don't have your complex password, you don't have your multi-factor setup. But it's like, oh, and they sign off and they think, I think like you have to read your policy, right? Because most coverages today will not cover ransomware payments, or if they do, they cover it to like fifty to 100000 which I don't know if is enough. Personally, I wouldn't think that's enough. Your legal fees, if the your employees or your staff or your clients come after you for privacy breaches, the cost to your business continuity if it's interrupted. And then also, you know, the insurance companies and brokers have requirements, me meaning you have to have a security awareness training. You have to have security policies that are signed off by all staff. If you suffer a breach and none of those are in place, they're not going to pay on the policy, and you'll probably not get coverage again. Um, so I would personally look at cyber insurance almost like a, a safety net or, or a life jacket. It doesn't replace good security practices, but it complements them. Okay. So so that that's really good to know. So that that's that's really good to know. That sort of and I think what people need to really pay attention to around the around insurance is the do you meet the, the basic requirements to Absolutely. To, to make a claim like i mean there are a lot of people you have policies but you cannot make a claim because you have not done as insurance company would say or just would say you have not done the best you can to protect yourself right 100%. so you cannot rely on insurance and it's uh and once once you have that kind of violation it's uh it's never a good time so we'll just keep going with you i mean i have, I have one last thing to speak over your child but i do have one last thing to to say like you don't necessarily have to go out and buy you know the, the most expensive power alto or f5 firewall to secure your services after hearing this the number one um return on investment that any business can make big corporation to small businesses is security awareness training and staying abreast of the breaches that are in the, the the landscape today. And there's a few small websites, like I would recommend US CERT, which is the US Air Force's cybersecurity website, or the Canada cyber.gc.ca, or sorry, cyber.gc.ca. Just take a look at that once every two weeks or so. It usually talks about known threats to industry. You can actually report security incidents if they occur so that others can be protected. And it's also a great place for your staff to kind of look at or yourself to look at from a security awareness training. They actually have a free security awareness training on that website that can be deployed as well. Sorry, Charles, okay. continue. Didn't want to speak no, no, keep, yeah, keep going. So, and yeah, and we're talking about how do you make sure that your employees, your business owners and the community are well informed and trained to recognize and respond to cybersecurity threats. Um, I think was that I think uh the race, do you want to talk about that or was that Pamela that we wanted to yeah, that one? Yeah, 100%. Go ahead, keep going. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so for me, I think, and again, the question is like, how can we ensure that employees, business owners in the community are well informed and trained to recognize and respond to cybersecurity threats effectively? And again, I go back to security awareness training. Um, continuous education is the key, one supporter. Because security is not a one-time task or a point in time, like an ISO uh, um, audit or a SOC 2 audit. I mean, that's just a point in time. Cybersecurity and th threats are always changing and emerging, especially now that we have AI so what ubiquitously used in, in society. Before, when it was only the practitioners leveraging it, it was one thing. And it was still a challenge. But now that everybody's using it in some way, shape, or form, um, it's, it's going to be a real challenge. And so my biggest recommendation would be force your team to have regular training sessions set up what's called simulating phishing attacks. And it's interesting, Pamela gave a great example earlier about a, a phishing attack where somebody actually leveraged the email 
fit and, and fish is spelled P-H as opposed to F-I-S-H. Just Google that term. And um, if you do have questions, you can reach out to anybody on this team or uh, just to myself directly off LinkedIn. And I can explain to you what that means. But it's basically like spoofing your own team's email. So they're trained to look out for these emails when they come in. Because if you're not trained to spot these emails and how they look, um, you can fall victim to it. They happen every day despite wide community awareness about it. And so that's why it's it's good for everybody to speak about it. When people understand the why behind these cybersecurity measures, they're more likely to follow them. So it's important that you inform your team as to the why. It's not just one more thing to do to check a box. It's actually extremely valuable to uh, maintaining the security and business continuity of your organization. And the last thing I'll say before passing it back to the panel as a Black founder is that I emphasize reaching out to the communities. And that's why I talk so much with the BPPA and everywhere else that will listen to me, just because I understand that it's so hard for us to get this training. It's a lot more normal for these people. Just like I was saying when I got into the space, it's almost like it's an elite club that these guys are in where they protect the, the uh, firewalls and they protect the banks and they protect the networks. And cracking into it is a, a very was a very difficult challenge. The one thing that we have on our side right now is that Big business and banks are realizing that there's a whole new world of unknown unknowns that come from scamming and chopping or princes from Africa, like things that they haven't even seen. And so they're starting to look into it more now and investing in our community. And so that's a, that's a good sign of hope, although there's so much work to be done to close that space. Yeah, right. <clears throat> thanks, the race. And uh, so I think a lot of people, they they would be, they, they think that there's a misconception that you, you only have, you should only be concerned about data that's stored on computers within your environment, right? So, and if you, and if you're using a cloud service, everything on the cloud side is, is under control. It's taken care of because you're using cloud services. So Ola, I'm going to ask you, it's like, uh, you know, we're not with this reliance on cloud services and the use of cloud applications where one would say, well, I don't have any computer systems. I, they're all taken care of by somebody else. My website's hosted somewhere. My applications are all cloud-based. What? Where is? Why should I have nothing? Why should I be concerned? Can you just can you just uh, tell us why that's not exactly true? Why that's? I, I think you know. Um, I, I would start with the fact that you know most organizations are realizing the advantages of cloud computing. Uh, when you think about it, um, I imagine a lot of organizations are like at various stages of the transformation journey of you know maybe moving our services to cloud or not, or even trying to make that decision, right? So, but which is not surprising, right? Um, I would say um, cloud security really involves um, around, you know, a combination of several factors, um, technology, you know, implementing policies and standards, um, you know, making sure procedures are in place, you know, to protect, you know, the cloud-based application. So, um, whether it's on premise, you know, or in the cloud, you still need to, you know, do the right thing, right? Um, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what what um, your your model is. You want to do the right thing um, in protecting your data. So, I would say, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter whether you know your services are in the cloud or or not. You know, um, protecting your data, making sure that the right stuff are in place is is critical. So, so what should a small business do to, you know, they are fully reliant on cloud services? What, what are some common sense things, some simple, straightforward things that a, a small business owner should do to ensure that they, you know, to protect themselves in the sense of that? Yeah. So um, I think the core principle of, you know, information secu security and, and data governance is, is also critical, um, whether you're in cloud. Or, or not, you know. So we are talking about confidentiality, integrity, availability. So um, speaking about you know protecting data from unauthorized access. So small business needs to like you know focus on that. You know, safeguarding data from unauthorized changes. You know, um, um, ensuring data is consistent and accessible. So all these apply. You know, regardless of you know the cloud model or the type of organization, whether you're a small business or not, right? Or whether you are. Um, going maybe private or public or hybrid or even community cloud. So regardless of the cloud computing categories, um, SaaS, you know, PaaS, IS, uh, or even functional as a service, you know, they need to make sure that you know the CIA, what we call the CIA triad, is is also you know being applied. Um, um, that being said, you know, 
um, organizations must also understand um, the shared responsibility model in the cloud. So um, I, you spoke about you know, whether your applications or systems are on premises. In that situation, you know, responsibility usually tie, you know, falls entirely on the, on the organization. Um, however, you know, in the in the in the cloud model, you know, there's this division of responsibility, which may be unclear in some situations, right? So, which may lead to problems, which you know may not be if if not properly understood, right? So, I think the challenge lies in you know the various ways in which this responsibility is shared among the different cloud models. Um, in all the models, um, cloud product providers will usually handle the fiscal infrastructure. Um, security, why, why the customer, you know, is probably responsible for the data classification or accountability, you know, as it may, as it may. So for, 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 for that responsibility, that shared responsibility needs to be understood, you know, and understanding the specific details, you know, of it and the model, you know, um, really um, gives, is, is really crucial, you know, in applying the right safeguards you know for security and application um i would also say that um small businesses in addition to that small businesses need to have like visibility um into um you know like a clear and review of you know what what is being assessed who is assessing data you know when the data is being assessed and you know what they are doing with the with the data you know the the, the lack of this visibility if, if you think about it you know, we usually lead to like ineffective, you know, access control, uh, which could mean risk to data. Um, another aspect is, you know, continuous monitoring, right? Um, I know that um, in the cloud, some people think that when um, you go into the cloud, that that responsibility, you know, is done. You, you don't need to do anything, but that, that we need to continuously have the surveillance and analysis of activities and events that is going on in the cloud environment to ensure that they are authorized, you know, and appropriate. Um, and so monitoring will also involve, you know, focusing on user activities, you know, um, looking at access patterns and potential security, security threats. Okay. Thanks so much, Ola. And I think the message there is like, it's your data, it's your information asset, it's your problem, right? And you have to be on top of it. Thank you so much. So, I mean, I, no conversation would be complete without, you know, without some mention of COVID in some way, shape or form. Like, I mean, it's changed, it's, it's dramatically changed our lives in the last few years. It's changed the way we work. It's changed the, the structure of organizations. Like, I mean, like my team now includes people in Brazil, right? Where we just, uh, before I would have been, and prior to COVID, I was, I was looking at office space downtown Toronto, right? So, so let's say now that we've got our teams that are spread out, work is hybrid, people are no longer in the office. You can't just do the, the, the verification that someone is real or something is real. You might have coworkers that you've never met and it might not even be real people if you haven't met, interviewed them. So, so as we get into this hybrid workspace, how do we go about protecting identity data applications? Pamela, can you just give us some insight into give us your thoughts on that? You're right, uh, organizations are moving or some have already moved to a hybrid workforce. Uh, that's pretty much our everyday lives now. <laughs> yeah, and definitely has its security implications and there's the need to you know, consider security as we you know, get settled in these hybrid models. So for, I would just call out just a few uh, items to, you know, Keep in mind while we're working, you know, with the hybrid model. So for sure, uh, one thing, number one thing, I would want to call out. You know, I, I think a lot of people are also aware of it. You know, everything starts from policy. Uh, if you want to implement something, and it has to come from, you know, top-down approach, just to ensure that people are, are, are bound by it and know what they're meant to do and what they shouldn't do. So yeah, policies, uh, hybrid policies with cybersecurity considerations should be in place. And as well, uh, second thing I would call out is, of course, everyone again knows this. Uh, we always been told, you know, if you're working remotely, you have to ensure you're connecting via the VPN, which is the private, uh, uh, virtual private network, which is pretty much just a secure tunnel that helps us connect directly to our organization's network that is secure. And then on top of that, we are, you know, always been told to use uh, multi-factor authentication that has become 
very popular term in recent times because now it's been you know it, it's known now that passwords alone are no longer secure we need to combine the passwords with other forms of authentication so you know mixing it in with something you know that's the password and then we sometimes put an additional layer of something you have so that uh, multi-factor authentication the additional one could be uh, like a hardware item, like a, a, a token or a soft token or some kind of smart card or sort of something you have in your physical possession just to give an extra layer of um, authentication. Or sometimes it's at something you are, which is like a biometric, like a fingerprint or a retina scan or a speech pattern or something. But these have become, you know, very, very uh, important and key these days in uh, getting authentication, especially if you're working remotely. Um, another thing I would also want to call out is, uh, you know, how you design your architecture. So there's what we call like the zero trust uh, architecture, which is pretty much uh, saying that all the devices, uh, services, everything within your organization's network, just because they're all in the network, doesn't mean that they automatically have access to each other. So the zero trust policy is saying that even though we're all in the same network, you still have to authenticate every time you need to access something else within the same network. So that way this helps protect, you know, in case, you know, the threat actor, they still have to authenticate and that, you know, becomes a problem for them and they can't, you know, won't be able to do anything, you know, they won't be successful with whatever mission they had. So that's another thing that uh, uh, helps uh, put an additional layer of security. Uh, and it, again, is the monitoring controls. You know, we monitor the accesses, monitor the logins, monitor the activities. Uh, uh, this helps. Uh, where there is an investigation chart and then you're able to see what has who has accessed what and you know and all of that it also could serve as a deterrent as well because you could have you know the threats don't only come from outside your organization yeah. hang on Pamela I think your your your, your network seems threats. to be a bit uh, a bit compromised uh, uh, you could either check I mean so it might help a little bit if you just turn your camera off Pardon? Threat. Like, like an internal employee of the organization. So sometimes even if they know that you, this money. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll turn it off. Hi, Charles. Yeah, I can. I, I think, think you're good now. Time. Pamela, I think you're, you there? I think you're good now. You the, yeah, I can hear you well. I think the video Yeah, I was turned off my camera. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think you're good now. Oh, okay. I turned it off. Yeah, yeah. Point, uh, which is you know uh, when there is a termination, uh, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. Sometimes people are in the office. Sometimes they're working remotely. So wherever it doesn't matter where they are, like the policy for access revocation should still be in place to revoke those accesses within you know a specific time frame, as well as you know. Uh, retrieval of um, assets of the laptops, gadgets, or whatever organization assets are, are there. Sometimes, you know, because they're remote, it might take a little longer, but you have to ensure that you have policies in place that govern how those access are going to be retrieved and done, you know, in, in a good amount of time. So those are my points I, I, I would wanted to, I wanted to list. Okay. No, thanks. Thank, thanks so much, Pamela. So, and so could you just give a couple of examples of the kind of policies that uh, people, because you mentioned started off with policies and policies are very important and, and controls. And we just don't have enough time in this conversation today to get into all of those. But a couple of examples of the kind of policies that are not the minimum policies an organization should have or a, a small business should have to say that we are, you know, we're taking these steps. Yeah, having your, your cyber security, you know, you can have like an overarching policy that just states, you know, we, we, we're taking cyber security seriously. And due to that, we, we've implemented these this, uh, tools in place. We've deployed these tools. We've, you know, uh, 
improve this process and also when you have all that stated or signed off by management as well and published and you have your employees you know ensure that you, whether it's upon uh, onboarding or an annual review like they look at that policy and then they acknowledge it as well uh, and get signed off on it to be sure that you know they're going to follow that policy so some of the things that we can put in there you know it could break down into different areas and different domains but you know sometimes you know you might want to keep it high level and then when you want a specific you might want specific details about a particular area for example passwords uh, a whole policy on a password uh, could be available and then they could be directed to those password policies that will tell them okay you know passwords again like I mentioned earlier are no longer enough you need MFA so you have to ensure that you know in fact you have to enforce this thing so it's not just saying this is what you need to do you have to enforce this with, within the system such that they try to log into their laptop but they cannot successfully log in unless they you know add that additional uh, factor authentication to get signed in so things like that um, Again, awareness training, again, just like the rest mentioned as well, you know, all those things we put in the policy to let people know that yeah, yeah, you're taking cybersecurity uh, very seriously. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much, Pamela. So 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 you see, with all this talk about security, what I, <clears throat> I think I'm sure most people here are just kind of like, okay, this is just painful, right? This is this is awful. I remember when I, you know, my brother used to live in the Bronx uh, when I lived in Toronto and uh and I went to his apartment and he had like four locks on his door, like one that turned this way, one turned the other way. And it's like, and it's like for security. So this, this, this security is highly, highly inconvenient, right? Like, I mean, it's like, it's just so easy if you just, you know, just, you know, like just leave your door open or just, you know, so, so the race, like, I mean, you work in security, you, yes, your job and your team, they're focused on creating these inconveniences for people in the interest of their safety. How do you like, how do you balance that? How do you, where, where do you draw the line on uh, the, you know, the, the need for convenience? Like you just want to just walk right in. You don't want to stop. You don't want to have to do all that. How do you balance that? Like what's the, give us some, what, what do you think of that? Um, okay. A couple of things. So first on the balance side, balancing convenience and security is always going to be a challenge. It's like the work-life balancing for entrepreneurs. There's no such thing. You just have to learn how to live within the work that you're doing. And it's the same thing with cybersecurity. There's no convenience really. Like how convenient would it be if you allowed your bank account to be drawn to zero? And then think about trying to raise investment from people if you're not really secure on cybersecurity. Um, so you probably won't get much investment in your business or have money in your account if you're not protecting it. Most, um, Back to Charles's example about a physical door with multiple locks in it in the neighborhood, um, it's exactly that. Like if you had your business, you wouldn't leave it open uh, and go home and sleep at night and rest comfortably. At least I wouldn't, right? And so I think it's important that while we seek instant access, convenience, and seamless experiences for swift transactions, we have to recall that every point of convenience can also be a potential vulnerability. So my recommendation, again, is a layered approach. First, foundational security measures. So we heard earlier, strong passwords, MFA, which is multi-factor authentication for anyone who's not sure what that term means. It's basically having two pieces of, a, uh, of identification, either a password and a code that comes to your phone or a password and a, and a make it maybe a rolling code that's on your phone or a, a secure ID from RSA if you're still using that. And then regular software updates. If your phone set like this, my, my, my parents are notorious for this where I'll take their phone. I'm looking at it, looking at some pictures or helping to send something to my aunts back home. And it's like, mom, you haven't updated the phone for like two weeks. Wow. <laughs> Is there an issue? Oh, it's always slow. Or it's sometimes when I do it, I can't talk on my Zoom. So I was going to get to it. You always have to allow the updates because those updates, 90% of the time are related to a security vulnerability that's affected people. Right. Uh, so that's very important. The other piece about convenience, uh, Charles, is Education is key, right? Just like how a lot of us were raised knowing that, you know, the books will set you free. You got to educate your employees and your staff as well as your clients on the importance of security and have them understand that sometimes a small delay in security will be ultimately in their best interest. Usually customers, clients, and, and employees are, are okay with that. And also use the technology to your advantage, right? Modern security solutions offer robust protection without hampering the user experience. So if you're in the cloud, like we were talking about earlier, and of course you do have to maintain that compliance configuration and security in the cloud, um, make sure that you have a system in there like an Okta or an advanced threat protection if you're in Microsoft 365, so that's actually enhancing your security posture on your behalf while you're out doing your business. Lastly, I'll say um, regularly review your policies, procedures, and your posture, and then adapt to change with the threats in the landscape. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a few websites that you can go to. One is uh, canada.gc.ca. 
or uh, US cert in the States, they'll always tell you about the emerging threats and they'll even send you um, updates if you have your own technology. For example, if you have a Cisco router, maybe a Meraki switch, uh, an, an access point made by um, Lenovo, for example, you can put those um, equipment into this website and they'll actually send you updates when your actual technology stack is affected. I strongly recommend that so that you can stay ahead of the curve when it comes to being um, cyber secure. Okay. So, so thanks, the race, and uh, so, and and we could, and there are so many other things that people could do to stay to stay safe. And there's yeah. there's ways around integrating your I think like authenticator. There's a lot of things that uh, a lot of other things that could be used for for protection. So the, the thing is, like now now that COVID's you know not over, but we're we're back on the road. We're traveling. We're we're out in different places, and uh, I think uh, thank God for, probably all of us are in different cities at this time, like. So with uh, we're traveling, people on our teams are traveling, and uh, our employees. What what uh, what precautions should they take? Like, I mean, so you're out there, you you know, like uh, should should people be taken now uh, to, you know, to protect themselves and to protect the the, the business while they're away? I think uh, I, I don't I know how. You want to start with that, Doris? And yeah, I got a couple of thoughts and I can pass it to the team. So essentially, yeah. one thing, so as you guys know, I'm always on the road, as you know, Charles, I'm always on the road talking to clients or, re or investors. And the one thing I always talk to my team about as well as myself and people when I speak on, on talks like this is public Wi-Fi is the enemy of cybersecurity. It's like a public park. It's convenient, but it's not safe. <laughs> Please, like right now I'm in a hotel room in a very nice hotel. I'm on VPN because... I don't know who's listening on this network. I don't want to, you know, my emails. So what is a VPN? It's a virtual public network or a tunnel to a secure server that allows you to have encrypted transactions or encrypted data transactions. Essentially, it's safe, right? When you're using public Wi-Fi, you don't know who's really... At, well, first of all, there's things called man-in-the-middle attacks, which it appears to be public Wi-Fi, but it's really some hacker's computer in the same location. They're in airports, they're in hospital lounge, hotel lounges, hospitals. So you always need to be in a VPN when accessing sensitive data. I just do it all the time if I'm not on my home network. And when I'm on my home network, my router, which brings internet into my home, also has a VPN on it because I cannot afford not to have that. Not only that, but my customers, my investors, it's just I cannot afford to have a breach. And so therefore, I'm extremely meticulous about my security posture. Um, in addition to um, protecting against man in the middle attacks, VPNs help with eavesdropping and uh, the malicious hotspots that are ma masquerading as legitimate networks. And, and then I'll pass it to the rest of the team for any other tidbits. But uh, okay. th those are the things that my team has to have. Yeah, so Pamela, you might want to jump in. Not everyone is a security is a security guru like the race who could just set up their you know just set up their own ninja network for to protect themselves. So what what so what what are, what are your other thoughts on what are some other thoughts on this that people could do to to protect themselves yeah. when they're yeah it, it, yeah thank you so much Charles yeah so if they're traveling it, it's usually best if you don't have to don't take your laptop like. If you're not really traveling for work, but you're thinking maybe you would try to see if you, you know, just check a few, just don't take your laptop. It's just best to just keep it back at home. But then on the other hand, if, you know, depending on the kind of trip you're going on, if you absolutely have to take your laptop, uh, then the, the, the second best advice would be, you know, you could get a lunar device. So, you know, some organizations, they, you know, have these policies in place where if you have to travel with a laptop, because, it, you know, depending on kind of data you handle, your laptop, your personal, your organization owned laptop might have some sensitive information. So they would ask you to go to IT department just to get a lunar device that is pretty much cleaned, wiped, like it doesn't have, it just gives you a device to send emails and, you know, whatnot. Uh, so that would be the second best advice. And then if you still, you know, find yourself on the road with your laptop, again, just like the race has said, like public Wi-Fi, like again, VPN is a must, like you have to use VPN. If there's MFA as well, lay it on top of that VPN as well in, in during your authentications as well. And just, you know, be on the lookout, you know, sometimes, you know, just going to some certain countries, you know, like some countries, for example, that might not be in, you know, very good standing with Canada, you never know. And some countries are known for having nation state sponsored hackers that are backed by the government. So you never know what their tactics are. They might like, you know, what? we're just going to target Canadian citizens, American citizens, you know, and just, you know, 
start from there. So it's just good to be aware, you know, just taking that extra precaution when you go to those countries. And lastly, I would say, you know, it's, it's good to immediately report, like if your laptop gets lost, stolen or something, you have to report it immediately. Because, you know, if you, when you report it immediately, you know, the IT or security department usually has a capability to remote wipe the device such that, you know, all the data would be removed and wiped clean. So even when the thieves uh, try to open the laptop to get, you know, whatever they've stolen or the data, they won't find anything there, right? So that's also another, another good practice to, to keep in mind as well. So... Uh, yeah. I just, yeah, Ola, you've got some thoughts. Yeah, yeah, I just, you know, like uh, Pamela said, if you must go with your laptop, make sure your, you know, official laptop is with you all the time. Um, you know, you know, be, be very vigilant. Make sure you have it like close to you where your eyes can, you know, easily see and watch. And, you know, exactly what Pamela said, you are not sure who is watching, who is being targeted. You know, be very, very cautious of social engineering. Um, so I'm talking about like phishing emails when you're on your trips or even phone calls or even SMSs. So just to add to that. Okay, thank you. I just uh, noticed that we acknowledge our CEO, uh, Nadine, Nadine Spencer, who's got a question or a comment. She's got her hand up. Go ahead, Nadine. There we go. Hi, Charles. Hello, everyone. This is an excellent conversation and I wanna thank you uh, to Derace and the team at Law Blah for being part of this conversation. I, I, I wanted to just weigh in and comment that for entrepreneurs on the line, one of the best business practices that's been evolving is the importance of a cybersecurity policy in your business. Because I know that with some organizations, you know, they they will not do business with you if you don't have that, because they have to protect their intellectual IP as well. And they're also concerned about cybersecurity. So if you want to do business with big banks, big corporate Canada, you we really have to have this cybersecurity policy in place. And to the team's points that they've pointed out, we have to show that we are actively practicing and enacting and checking on the policy with our team. So for businesses who want those large accounts, this is one of the check boxes that we have to have as a best practice in our businesses. Thanks, Nadine. Yeah. That's, that, that's yeah, very, very, that's well very insightful. 100%. Yeah. Very well said. Absolutely. So, so as we get into the future part of the conversation, we're almost running out of time, which is too bad. We need way more time for these things. Is uh, so I'll just ju ask, keep it on you, Ola. I like what what are the emerging technologies or trends or things that people should be keep? and there's so many. Like I mean, some that you could just think of that would be helpful and applicable for 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 small business and entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely touch on that. Um, I think Pamela mentioned zero trust. You know, um, I think that's one emerging technology that people should you know um, watch out for. Um, zero trust architecture, zero trust um, approach. Um, you know, this is really a shift in cybersecurity, especially given the, you know, recognition that, you know, threats can also originate from, you know, not only external, but in also internal sources, right? So um, I mentioned something about the traditional perimeter. Um, usually before now, um, once someone is within that, you know, perimeter or what is considered like the trusted zone, you know, the users, you know, will usually be given like a wide, you know, access. But in reality, you know, threats can actually come from both inside and outside. So the core principle of, you know, the zero trust architecture is never trust and always verify. You know, this means that, you know, as, you know, wherever users are located, whether inside the network, working remotely or accessing, you know, cloud resources, you know, they are subject to, you know, continuous verification, continuous authorization you know, and access to resources only granted to, you know, users that have already been verified, their identity have been verified, and, and the device security is thoroughly confirmed, right? Um, that's about zero trust. Another one would be artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm sure, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, I'm sure a lot of people know about what's happening with chat GPT and all, um, you know, this continue to gain, you know, increasing importance um, due to, you know, the capabilities, 
in processing and analyzing you know, vast amounts of data, you know, with you know remarkable speed and accuracy as well. So today we already have the technology being used in in like threat detection, um, you know, to detect you know threats. Also in response to you know ident you know to identify known and unknown threats you know within within organizations. So machine learning you know they are being used you know to also detect um, phishing attempts you know fraudulent activities you know helping to enhance um, security. And I think the last one to watch out for will be quantum computing. Um, you know this definitely has you know the potential to like really disrupt the field of cyber security, um, especially with the impact around ability to break existing encryption methods, um, you know, also through you know powerful computational capability. So this is for for quantum computing. I think this is being being viewed as you know both positive and negative. Uh, when you think about it, on one hand, quantum computing can you know can help improve encryption algorithm, um, rendering data more secure, you know, versus the basic or classic encryption breaking methods. But on the other hand. Quantum computing also has the capabilities to break existing encryption methods. So, yeah. you know, all the encrypted data that we have today are vulnerable uh, when when quantum computing comes into into place. Uh, we are still in the transition period for for quantum resistance um, and encryption methods, but that risk, you know, is, that is still poses that risk, you know, to to people in cyber. And th th those would be my like top three. I just want to add yeah. to all this point. All, all of your uh, what's this qubit? So I was just at a our investor bank in New York. They actually have a qubit machine that's functioning there, and other banks have it as well. So it's not as far off into the North Star as people think. The investment banks have it, which means that the like high tech companies probably have this equipment as well. And so it's coming fast and furious down, and yeah. people still can't secure against it. So I'd love to have a sidebar with you one day when you have, have some time to chat about it. Um, bringing it back to the audience here, though, I just have a few quick things I wanted to leave everybody with as I, I tend to do, right? So the first thing I want everybody to really do is do a, a, a thorough risk assessment of your environment. Identify the assets that Pamela spoke about earlier, your, your laptops, your phones, because phones are computers too, um, your tablets. These are all your, your digital assets. Ensure they all have antivirus software on them at a minimum. You can put in a firewall if you know how to implement it. There's a Windows firewall on your actual operating system that you can turn on. I strongly recommend turning it on. Window all, Windows also has a free multi-factor authentication authenticator. Google also offers one as well. Please take regular system backups. Remember employee training. And after that is completed, please prioritize the areas specific to your business. For example, if you use credit cards or payment cards, look up PCI DSS or Visa DSS. This is a standard that governs the payment card industry, and it has cybersecurity concerns um, considerations that you can easily leverage. Last but not least, remember that cybersecurity is not a point-in-time thing like an audit. Regularly review and update your, update your environment. Keep your updates on for software updates to your phones and computers and devices. And as somebody who came from an unlikely background in cyber, just remember that the outsider perspective is actually where most of these gaps are going to come from. So if your mind or your gut tells you that something is off, please follow it up with either asking questions, following up with a computer expert that you have in your purview. And in worst case scenario, you can always reach out to myself. I'm happy to help. Yeah, thanks, Darius. <clears throat> and that's a very good segue into where we're pretty much, we have a couple of minutes left. And uh, the one question is like, I mean, I think people are sitting here on the call going, watching us experts saying, these people seem to be having incredible lives and a lot of fun. So what's the, uh, how do people, like if someone wants to get into this field and, and there's 30 seconds, not, no more than 30 seconds, someone who wants to get into this field or wants to, you know, start a career in cybersecurity or pivot into cybersecurity, what would, uh, what advice would you give them? Very, very short, because we're, we're pretty much at time. Uh, we'll start with you, Pamela. Yeah, I would say like research, research. Uh, Google is your friend and uh, trainings are available. Uh, just Google and then you would find, you know, areas because it's a very wide uh, uh, domain, like lots of subdomains within cybersecurity. So just, you know, you'll be able to find where you think you might be able to, able to fit in. And then trainings are available. Take trainings, ask questions, join forums, you know, like this where you could learn more. And there's just, just a lot of uh, opportunities out there. And you, you never know, you, you know, it just, once you take the first step, you, you start to see like doors just opening in front of you, you know? So that's just yeah. what I would say, yeah. Thank you. Ola? Yeah, I would, I would add to that. I would say, you know, join cybersecurity communities. Um, 
like this one, attend conferences, you know, connect with prof professionals, ask questions, um, stay informed, stay up to date with, you know, the latest trends, trades, technologies, you know, in the field. Um, there are many apps that you can use for like daily news, daily, you know, cast, you know, that, that talks about cybersecurity and the cybersecurity space, you know, stay informed with that. And um, don't be afraid to intern, you know, internship opportunities, you know, met mentorship opportunities are always available, um, especially within organizations because of the gap within the cybersecurity space. So yeah, there are many of those opportunities. So I would say if possible, gain practical experience through like internship or mentorship or, or the likes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Darius, you've got 15 seconds. Yeah, so just for me, it's a little curiosity. I agree with everybody else. Google is your friend, get into the community groups, but I believe it's curiosity. So just continue to be curious, ask questions anywhere you can get a source and then validate. Trust, but verify. So once you get a source, verify it elsewhere and then you should be well on your way. I add, also added my link to set a time if you guys want to meet and my LinkedIn is there as well. I unfortunately do have to run for a client meeting like right now, but I do appreciate the time. And if you have any questions, I'll follow up with Charles and the team after to, to get in touch. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you so much.